Welcome to Mavericks. I'm Joey Garcia, and in today's episode, we'll be speaking to one of the brightest tech innovators in Latin America. He's the co-founder and CEO of Bitso, which has gained more than 6 million users worldwide from their base in Mexico City. He's a serial entrepreneur and a maverick. It's Daniel Vogel. This is Mavericks, brought to you by Zappa Bank. All right, well, morning, Daniel. It's great to, to have you here. Yeah. Let, let me kick things off. It's, it's um, I mean, we've known each other for a while. Um, everything I read about you, they always uses the same term. I, I'd call you um, a serial entrepreneur, <laughs> if I can put you that. That's a, a tough sort of phase. But it's interesting because I remember reading some stuff about you early days. And I wanted to ask you, your first sort of touch points to tech. I heard these or read these stories about, I think it was one of your older brothers or something coming back and talking to you about the internet. So the early, early days, how, how did your touch point to technology generally, how did that all kick off? Yeah, first of all, Joey, thank you for, for having me here. As you said, known each other for, I guess, like half a decade by now. Yeah. Which in blockchain years is like 100. <laughs> That's exactly. Um, I'm very happy to be here and, uh, and thank you for the space. So yeah, I mean, look, as a kid, I guess depends on what you mean by tech, but I always just enjoy fiddling around with electronics. I remember, you know, I remember like an, an early memory of mine is, uh, you know, the rotary phones changing to, you know, yeah. the touch, what, what, what do you call them actually? Like, I yeah, guess. Yeah, touch pads or, touch pads or something. And, um, and my mother being a little bit upset that, the, you know, the electrician had only switched half of them and that now we couldn't use the phones, the other half of the phones. And I remember having looked at what the electrician was doing and thinking this isn't actually that hard. And I actually ended up changing those myself. And um, and obviously my mom was very impressed and I think I just got a kick out of that. And so, um, I don't know, just throughout being a child, I always enjoyed fiddling with electronics, mechanical stuff. And then obviously when computers kind of appeared, um, like, well, I remember actually playing with an early Apple II that my dad had bought very early on. But I guess the thing that really sort of kicked it for me was the internet. The internet was suddenly an opportunity to connect with individuals around the world that um, I didn't really have easy access to. And so I had a, a, a hobby in remote controlled cars as a yeah. kid. And I had actually not found that many people who enjoyed that in Mexico. And suddenly the internet connected me with, you know, tons of like-minded folks, a lot of them young like me, who just like remote control cars. And it, for the first time ever, gave me the ability to connect with someone and um, and talk about the same things. Yes, yeah, I can so, imagine. And, and then, and that was like early, early days. So what was the crossover to blockchain infrastructure or technology. What were, what were your first sort of touch points to that? I think I read, again, some early days, uh, Quantcast and talking about peer-to-peer -peer transactions or something, but what, how, did you, how did you make that step across? Yeah, so, I mean, I, then, I went on and I went to study computer systems engineering and economics um, in college. And when I graduated from college, I was living in San Francisco and a good friend of mine who actually had interned for Wences um, during a summer, basically basically told me about Bitcoin. And he said, hey, have you seen this thing? I said, no. He said, you should read about it. I think you'd enjoy it. And it was kind of interesting. Like I went and I, I remember going back home and pulling up like on Google Bitcoin and about to go to bed and just clicking the first link. And the story that I tell people is that literally the next thing I knew was, the sun was rising and I'd spend the whole night reading about this thing. And I'd say it was just a ton of skepticism at first. What What do you mean? I think the first description I read about Bitcoin was Bitcoin is a decentralized uh, currency that works peer-to-peer -peer without the necessity of government intervention. And it's an economic experiment. It was something amongst those lines. And I was just like, I don't understand half of what yeah. is being written here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Like all of us, right? I mean, yeah. I think, and, and it's, but it's it's interesting. I, I, I'd i say, I don't know if you agree, like, I mean, this has happened with like all technology. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, internet, whatever value from an internet of data, um, we've kind of seen it with, I don't know, 
we always use the same examples, file sharing. You know, originally it was all sort of really basic stuff or email all the way through to sort of illegal music sharing, all the way through to efficient sort of Spotify-based systems and everything else. And that's the same with, I don't know, calls. We started like on basic calls and Skype came around and Absolutely. communication with ISPs and it sort of happened in lots of different ways. Do you think this is the same thing? Are we oh. sort of... A hundred percent. I mean, you see the same trend all over the place, right? I remember I was telling you that I enjoyed remote control cars. So one of the first sort of like, uh, you know, internet things that I did was a, a, a website for remote control cars. And I uploaded movies there of remote control cars doing stunts. And it would take me, I don't know, a weekend to upload a movie. And then folks around the world that wanted to download this movie would take a weekend to download these video files, right? And now you're walking around and you basically open your phone and you can stream something in extremely high quality on your phone, right? That mm. took 25 years, mm. you know, but um, but I think the, the, the secret to that is basically a ton of really smart people working incessantly on improving the experiences, on improving the technology, on basically um, imagining a better world and working towards that. And I definitely feel that happening or see that happening in crypto, right? Like I, transactions were yeah. slow, were expensive. They've gotten that, you know, we've figured out ways to make them faster, cheaper. Um, there's, we still have a long ways to go, but you know, we started with very simple peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Now you have decentralized applications running on, on public blockchains. Um, and I just see no end to this. There's, there's just so many smart people working on this across the world that the, you know, the sentiment of sort of those early internet days, the sentiment of, you know, the first mobile apps, the sentiment of those first, uh, you know, web 2.0 websites, you're basically kind of seeing it all over again. Mm. You know? Do you think, do you think, Daniel, I mean, let me ask you a little bit, slightly more challenging question. So, um, those are all really good examples. And let's say with an internet of value, let's talk about email as a starting point and then mm -hmm. web two or whatever you want to call it. There are all these millions of applications built on, on, uh, on, you know, the language of TCP IP or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, what would you say to the criticism that sometimes, I mean, I hear it, I'm sure you hear it, blockchain technology starting with an internet of value based system or, a, a, you know, whatever the Bitcoin protocol, all these evolutions have happened. The EVM and Ethereum network and smart contract functionality. Some people say all of this stuff has been happening for a long time, but where are the real case applications and, and use of that stuff today? Is it is that still to come or is it not happening at the pace you would have expected five years ago? What, what, what do you think? Yeah, no, look, I think there's actually a fair amount of applications that are happening that people are maybe just blind to them. Um, you know, you talk to young folks that are on Discord and that do online gaming and they utilize Ethereum, you know, day in and day out. Um, you talk about, you know, our case at Bitso with remittances and we power billions of dollars that flow from the U.S. to Mexico um, on a yearly basis that are all going through the Internet of value, if you want to call it that, right? All through blockchain technology, all through crypto. And so I think I think it's sometimes hard for people to understand, um, to understand, you know, we have employees in, in Argentina and we talk to them and a large portion of them utilize stable coins to escape the devaluation of their own currencies. Mm. And so these are all cases that are happening left and right. Um, I do believe that crypto is still complex and we still need to work on simplifying it, right? Like I'll tell you an early story. Um, I remember the first time that I connected my dad to the internet, right? It was a process, sort of like crypto is a process today. It required um, yelling my mom and telling her not to pick up the phone because if she did that, we would lose access, <laughs> right? You would unplug the phone, yeah, plug in the modem. You'd have this computer that you have to power on. It would take time to power on. And then, you know, you then have to put in this password into uh, a modem and it would do this weird sound and then you were connected, right? And I remember going through this 10 minute process with my dad and then he said to me, well, now what? I said, well, now, I don't know. Now you can go and like read the news online. He's like, 
I have the newspaper that was delivered to me in the morning. Why would I go through this process to read the news? We no longer think of the internet as a process. We're permanently connected to the point where like, you know, before starting mm. this, this uh, session, we were asked to please silence our phones because we're just permanently connected to the internet. The internet went from something that was a curiosity that people did and an activity that you had to set a time aside for to just something that is deeply embedded in our daily day lives. But it took time. It took quite a bit of time for it to become that. Right? And do you think that that's the same process we're in? A hundred percent. I think money is going to become more borderless. It's going to become more digital. It's going to become faster, cheaper cheaper to transact. And I believe that this technology is going to be at the center of how all of that happens. And, um, but it doesn't happen overnight and we're not there yet, right? The same way that we weren't there with a uh, user experience of the internet in the nineties and we weren't there in the two thousands, right? Like it really actually took uh, smartphones to take place and then for mobile networks to actually support these smartphones and then smartphones getting better, et cetera, et cetera. It took a while. We forgot, we forget mm. about that because it just becomes so, um, so embedded in our day-to-day -day life and it happens so slowly, mm. but absolutely. I mean, like we talk to young people that are clients at Bitso and um, their relationship with money is fundamentally different to my relationship to money when I was a kid. These folks are used to be able to send value across the world instantly. That was something that was not a possibility for me when I was, you know, in my early twenties, in my mid twenties. Mm. And, um, and these folks are going to be, you know, by like folks that were in their teens when Bitcoin appeared are now in their twenties. They're about to go into sort of become economically active, if you will. Mm. And um, and that's just part of technology and evolution. And, and so the, the old tech, Daniel, the old tech hasn't hasn't kept up, right? So that, that young 25 year old today can do that cross border, immediate peer to peer uh, settlement. But if he wants to do his uh, bank transfer through a classic Mexico based bank into New York, wherever it can take three days, it can cost him $20, right? There's still, it still hasn't caught up. The legacy tech st is still nowhere near Absolutely. catching up this, this technology. I mean, look, um, there are places in the world where this is a reality. We have great companies that have built great products, right? Like uh, companies like Revolut, especially here in Jib. Like I, I, you see people that are walking across the border or crossing the border, and they rely on on companies like Revolut quite a bit. But I was in I was in Cartagena last weekend at a friend's wedding. We had friends from all over the world who were getting together to celebrate one of our friends getting married, and we had to settle accounts. All these joint banking systems all very low amounts, right? Like I'm not transferring thousands of dollars. I had to pay $45 to someone who paid, picked up the bill because my wife had to go get ready for the wedding. You don't have, I don't have a good way to do that, right? Like I'm living in Brazil. I don't have a good connection to my buddy who is living in Miami. Mm. Yeah, I told him, like, can I just send you crypto? Absolutely. It's like amazing. We did the transaction, it was like magic, right? But these things are, you know, I, I couldn't have dreamed of doing, I couldn't have dreamt of doing that like five years ago. Now it was on, I didn't even know if my buddy had a, a crypto account. Yeah, he was like, yeah. oh yeah, sure. Can we do it through crypto? Yeah, we're still getting there, right? Like it's still not um, top of mind. If you're an American, okay, well let's use Venmo or let's use Cash App or whatever. But in this case, these joint banking systems and we can suddenly have a common language to speak to one another. Mm, mm, and, mm, um, mm, and that's quite powerful. And I think we have a growing digital economy. We have, and when I mean digital economy, I don't only mean the economy of the internet. I just mean transactions that are happening digitally. And, um, and, and you need to have more interconnectivity. The internet has never had yeah. uh, a native value transfer. And, 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 yeah. In my opinion, this is it. Do you think that, do you think, uh, let me ask you another sort of question, relates to all this. So Bitso are a massive platform, millions, service millions of customers from around the world, et cetera. Exchange platforms generally are the average user's access point to, to that world or that, that sort of asset class. We've all heard to the nth degree, uh, FTX related issues and, problems and so that's not a really a tech risk it's nothing to do with the underlying technology it's a you know counterpart risk or an entry point risk um do you see that as a as a problem do you see that as a risk in the world do you see it as a yeah. you know, 
What, what, what are your thoughts, Jenna? Or, or what makes Bits so different from all of the, the, those no. platforms? No, it's a great question. Obviously, like, it's kind of interesting, right? Because the, the things that we preach in the industry as very powerful about this technology is basically it's transparency, exactly. it's decentralization, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And we've kind of realized that in order to connect the financial system as it existed before crypto and crypto, we, we, re, we rely on centralization, right? On these centralized exchanges. And the story of FTX is a really unfortunate one because I, it feels like we took the worst thing about finance and the worst thing about crypto, we put it together and created this, uh, this monster. But one of the things that makes me really like, like actually quite excited is that the thing that I always see happening in the crypto industry is that we see these problems and then we work relentlessly to basically solve them. And the technology actually gives us tools to solve some of the challenges that we saw with FTX. So the basic problem that FTX did is they weren't keeping one-to-one -one balances as they claimed they were. You know, if yeah. you had, if, if, if their customers had a thousand Bitcoins, they didn't really have a thousand Bitcoins. They were trading that in and out. Um, and as prices of different assets move, they weren't able to make uh, their clients whole, right? And it's fraudulent activity, but all of that happened on the blockchain, right? Like at least all the crypto assets, we have the ability to track them on the blockchain. Um, and one of the things that we believe is fundamental and that we've been working as Bitso and with, very other, with various other industry players is basically creating a cryptographic proof of solvency. And this is something that the industry had talked about a while ago, but we just kind of like, it, it didn't seem like there was demand yeah. to solve this problem. Well, now there's actually like, it's very sad that it took FTX for us to look, look into this again. But, um, but what do you, like, and sorry to interrupt you, yeah, Daniel, yeah. because I'm super interested in that, but the using the technology, the immediate output of that FTX and what lots of large platforms around the world selling to do was these, you know, proof of reserve uh, statements. They're yeah. just basic balance sheets, but I mean, there was no way of- Oh, no, those were uh, terrible. Exactly. No, 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 those were terrible. <laughs> exactly. Like those proof of reserves and, you know, displaying a list of addresses to claim that these are your coins, that, that that's, but there's That's no way of smoke. knowing any liability that attaches no. to those reserves. That anyway, was all right? smoke. What I'm talking about is something called a proof of solvency. Yeah. This is where you basically grab all your all, all the assets that you have on behalf of your clients, and you grab all the liabilities that you have on behalf of your clients, and you prove that your the assets that you hold are larger than the liabilities that you have against your clients. And um and you do this using a technology called zero knowledge proofs, which is basically allows you to cryptographically in a privacy preserving way, mm -hmm. do these attestations that you could potentially do them very frequently. They don't require human intervention, but you allow the world to sort of become your police. And so it, it's early on, um, we, we don't yet have an industry standard, but we're working on, what, I guess what I'm getting at is, this is an opportunity for, crypto companies, uh, custodians of crypto, to actually level up yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and utilize some of the things that blockchain actually allows you to do and has allowed us to do for a while now, but actually utilize that to be more transparent and to not rely on third parties, which we know that can be you know, corrupted, um, to show and give confidence to the market. We believe that this is a moment where trust is incredibly important. You know, the, the industry has suffered quite a bit, right? Like mm. one of the, what was perceived as a very legitimate player ended up being a big scam. This is an enormous opportunity for everybody else that is doing things correctly to actually, you know, leverage the technology to, to show that transparency, to give that comfort to, to customers, to regulators. This is an opportunity for regulators to understand what is the technology capable of and actually perhaps make even additional regulatory requirements, right? Like we wanna, we, we, there's not a great standard build yet. We're working with several you know, um, players in the industry, but we want a, a great standard to get built so that you know, companies, Custodians, crypto custodians around the world can basically adapt that standard 
and um, and then basically just show to their customers, like, look, we're part of the folks that are following this standard, mm. and then hopefully we can get regulators to also act on that standard. Right? Do you think? Do you think? I mean, that. I mean, I think that's amazing, and I, I definitely agree. Like, the tech can be used in so so many innovative, I mean, concepts around embedded supervision or even zero knowledge base embedded compliance systems. All, mm -hmm. all of that's really fascinating, but how, I'm a consumer, I'm a guy on the high street, how do I know the difference between a platform that offers a proof of solvency and, I mean, FTX were regulated, right? Yeah, Should I absolutely. just look at, hey, that's a regulated platform, and hey, look at the investors in that platform, all big brand names, how does, consumers aren't gonna do like due diligence Correct. on a VASP before absolutely. they get exposed to it. So is that a learning exercise, is it just, how, how will that happen? Yeah, so this is a great question, right? And I, I, I don't presume to have all the answers, but what I can tell you is um, the following. In my own journey, as I told you about that night where I was very confused reading about Bitcoin and trying to understand, you know, what is a, what is a confirmation and what is proof of work and these mm -hmm. all highly technical things that I didn't understand that, that now I understand very well. Um, it was a journey for me to really grasp those, understand them, and, um, and, and like me, there's been, you know, a lot of technical people that have gone on this journey and really understood that. And, um, and by large, people have, you know, in the, in the blockchain industry have policed themselves, right? Like people have built voices and they've uh, done due diligences. I mean, we've, we have significant amount of, you know, um, stories on how people have leveraged transactions on the blockchain to find coins that have moved that shouldn't have moved, et cetera, et cetera. So my hope is that while the majority of customers will never be sophisticated enough to understand what a zero knowledge proof of solvency, privacy preserving cryptographic proof is, you will be able to come with, um, with just people around the world that are technical that will become sort of police officers, right? Um, in, the, in the same way that it kind of already happens today, right? Like one of, the, one of the amazing things about crypto is that you got a ton of eyes on it, right? Like we've seen white hackers pull out uh, steal funds or remove funds, let's not say steal, remove funds from uh, smart contracts that could potentially have been hacked, right? We've also seen sadly attacks on smart contracts, right? But suddenly the world kind of becomes your eyes, right? And if, we can, and if we can just put those proofs out there, I think it'll give you the first sort of level of, um, of transparency. Where cryptographers, you know, we're working with uh, Dan Bonet at uh, Stanford University. He's one of the world's, you know, most mm -hmm. renowned cryptographers. Um, my hope is that he's gonna teach his students how this works, right? And that then you're gonna be able to have those folks actually look at the proofs that exchanges are putting out there and custodians are putting out there. And hopefully they will be able to start telling apart the folks that are you know, doing these attestations correctly and those that are not. And, and slowly over time, we're gonna be able to educate regulators. Yeah. yeah. And then regulators are gonna be able to get third parties and they're going to be able to say, hey, can you tell me if the attestations that Bitso is doing um, are actually like, you know, sound or not? And, 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 and the great thing about technology is that then we will be able to build technology that basically um, looks at the attestations and tells the regulator whether we're doing mm. this correctly or not. And then you're gonna have third parties that are going to run these systems and they're just gonna put websites like they already exist and say, you know, these are the exchanges that have run these attestations and these are the attestations that, um, that are sound and these are the ones that are not according to our software. And, and, and slowly over time, the great thing about this is that because you remove that human element, you can basically do this as often as you want, and you can get them reviewed as often as you want, and you're just gonna make we're just gonna make them public. And so, mm. you know, but the actual answer to your question, I think, is that our our sense is that this continues to evolve over time, and over time you basically get to a more trustless system overall, where centralized custodians will play a smaller and smaller and smaller role over time as we get really good at um, you know, solving 
some of the problems around self-custody, et cetera, et cetera. So our sense is that over time, you basically reduce the need to interact with centralized um, exchanges, custodians, and that, et cetera. That's, that, I mean, that's a really good, I mean, I, I was gonna ask you exactly the same question, really, if you talk about a trustless-based system or moving towards that and having that open, transparent networks and regulators understanding, all of that, but what would you say to the guys? I mean, post FTX, there were lots of people that you know proclaimed the argument. It's not a new argument, but you know, don't trust your counterparty. Yeah. Trust the code. Um, then post FTX, now we've had different issues with uh, some significant banks, Silicon Valley Bank, et cetera, et cetera. And again, the arguments coming about again. So in the crypto world, you have the whole world. Is, the DeFi universe of decentralized finance and the sort of trust the code, move the risk from the middleman to the middleware. Do you as like a centralized platform, do you see that as a risk? Do you see people moving in that direction? I can't trust a regulated platform. I can't trust a bank. I want to trust the code. What, what do you think? Yeah. So look, I think companies and definitely we at Bitso have placed, at, have tried to do a lot of work to instill trust in our customers, right? Um, and we obviously take our business incredibly seriously and we've been operating for almost nine years, nine years in a month actually. And uh, and we pride ourselves on having run this company for nine years and you know, our customer funds are safe. Uh, we've never had a, you know an inkling of any of these sort of crazy mm. things that we saw at, at FTX. Actually, when we saw what happened at FTX, you know, we were actually quite proud because a lot of the stuff that went wrong, or at least what we've heard from the stories that were wrong, we have a we've built systems to make sure that that never ever happens, right? Like we build systems that do reconciliations of our customer liabilities and our assets on an ongoing basis to make sure that we always have enough assets to cover those liabilities, right? And these run constantly and we know where the money is at and we have systems that tell us at all times where money is at. Like when we hear the stories of, oh yeah, I mean, we thought we were solvent, but it ended up being that we weren't. It's just like, holy smokes, like you built all this amazing technology, but what on earth were you actually doing? You the One of the most fundamental parts of running a centralized platform is to make sure that you remain solvent and, um, and they weren't able to do that custodianship mm. um, work for their clients, right? So, so we've done all of that and I'm extremely proud about the work that we've done as a company to do that. And I think there's a bunch of other crypto companies in the world that have taken this incredibly seriously as well. The, 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 there is always an issue though when humans are involved. It's just inherently there is an issue when humans are involved. It doesn't even need to mean that those humans are necessarily bad. It just, you know, mistakes get made. And, um, you know, a lot of what we're seeing with the Silicon Valley Bank that you're referring to, those are human mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. Like basic risk mismanagement mm -hmm. mistake. Um, and, and so as we think about sort of like the future, the thing that gets us really bullish about decentralization is that removal of that trust. We just feel like the future needs to be one where trust is always minimized, right? Hard to imagine how you can convert, you know, your Mexican pesos, Brazilian reais at a bank account in Mexico or Brazil into crypto without a centralized entity today. But I mean, we already have the building blocks of being able to do this without centralized counterparties, right? Like we started to talk about, you know, stable coins and, and talk about, um, you know, decentralized exchanges, uh, it's CBDCs, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe, st maybe stable coins as we learned by USDC and, you know, CBDCs will remain to have some element of some human trust element. But I think over time, um, I do envision sort of, you know, parts of the of the centralized requirements to be removed. And then do we see this as a threat of our business? Well, it's absolutely a threat to our current business, right? Mm -hmm. But we don't think it's a threat to the vision that we try to build as a company. We actually feel like that pushes us in the right direction of providing 
services to our customers on top of this entire digital economy that's getting built out. And we believe that, you know, if we are right about that thesis, you, you, there's a real opportunity to build products and services at, to help people around the world interact with these more technical, mathematical, um, you know, underlying blockchains. And so you talk, are you talking about access to DeFi? I mean, you're yeah, saying- absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It can be access to DeFi. It can be, um, you know, it can be uh, helping with securing private keys. It can be, and it doesn't need to mean that we secure them for them. It can just mean building products and services. So our customers can do that themselves, but we can help them. I mean, now I'm talking, you know, yeah, 10, yeah. 15 years out. Uh, so very far out, I would say. But, but I think the trend is kind of clear that um, whenever there is a human element, invariably things might go wrong. And so can we envision systems and products and services that are better? I think the answer to that is absolutely yes. Can we build them today and deploy them today? I think the answer is absolutely no. Mm. We don't have the technology, we don't have the user experiences, we don't have the throughput, we don't like, you know, the education, et cetera, et cetera. Um, mm. But just in the same way that, you know, in 1995, the rules when I was a kid were, you know, don't get into the car of strangers, don't put personal information on the internet, you know, don't, my dad wouldn't let me use his credit card for online purchases because it would get cloned. Uh, and and now you know you you leave New York airport and you press a button and you call a stranger from the internet and your <laughs> personal details and credit card details are there and you get into an Uber, right? Like mm. in 15 years, that change from being extremely taboo, never do it, to the way that you get from Manhattan to wherever you're getting, right? Like, I mean, you can call yeah, it a taxi yeah, as well, yeah. but you know, my my point sort of stands like you, these things shift pretty crazy when you look at longer time horizons. Do you think, Dale, because we, I mean, on, on all the points that we're touching, I mean, I sometimes use, like I was, when I talk about DeFi, um, I, I use, I say the Bitcoin is the ultimate DeFi project. It's mm -hmm. the most successful Absolutely. DeFi project out there. Um, so, but access to the Bitcoin protocol today can be through platforms like Bitso, through Zappo, through all of the platforms that exist around the world. Yeah. Do you think that that's gonna, will there be like a regulatory push? Will will decentralized finance come under more and more pressure so that ultimately, you know, the only access points will be through centralized, will CeFi to DeFi or TradFi to DeFi or whatever we wanna call it, will that be the future? Or do you think that there'll be massive networks that exist outside any regulated perimeter or anything that will service the world. Democratization of finance to the world through the through a website, that will be the future. Yeah, so, so, so often think about this question because I feel like it's gonna be, an, it's, it's gonna be both things, right? So you, mm. talked, you talked about file sharing and I think file sharing is kind of interesting, right? Like MP3s, MP3 is basically this technology that allowed you to compress audio files into very small files, right? Released in the late 90s. And at, at the core, it's just mathematics, right? Like at the core is you have a file with a bunch of data and they were able to basically run it through some algorithm where the loss of quality was you know, imperceptible to most people and you create a very small file that could then be easily transferred. And that led to a bunch of illegal MP3 file transfers, yeah. right? So we had Napster, Kaza, et cetera, et cetera. And people in the, you know, early 2000s were f f doing this P2P file sharing. And um, a lot of people never really got into it because they weren't technical enough. Um, some people got viruses by doing this. And then like, you know, Steve Jobs came in and said, we need to just rethink about the music industry. And he grabbed a technology that was mainly used for illegal purposes, which was just at the core, just mathematics. And he wrapped it into something that he was able to basically deliver to consumers very easily. And today I access all my music through systems like Spotify, right? Because I, I don't want I don't want to be trying to file share peer to peer. Like I don't even know if those technologies still exist today. They must. But like, you know, for me, what I care about 
is ease of use on my phone, being able to listen to music whenever I want or podcast or whatever, and I'm happy to pay for that service, right? So we took something that was like kind of irregulated, you know, comp uh, artists were fighting this, the music industry was trying to fight this, yeah. and then just we just packaged it in a way that was more accessible, where you leverage the benefits of the technology and you kind of like eliminated some of the, sh I don't want to say shittiness, but maybe the shittiness yeah. around stealing that, right? And, um, and, and, and like with financial, with crypto and DeFi, it's the same, right? Like you have at the core, at the core Bitcoin is just code. It's just mathematics. There's nothing inherently, um, you know, there, 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 there's, you can't, you can't actually ban it. Right, like, how do you? It's like trying to ban math. You can't, right? It's just out there. The, the this is Satoshi Nakamoto, him, her, them created this thing, and it's just a gift to the world, and it's out there. There's no way to really back. There's no way to put it back into the in, in Pandora's box. It's just out there. It exists. Now the question really becomes: How do we actually really use it for the benefit of all of us? When I was talking earlier about proof of solvency, I feel like. Once regulators start understanding some of the stuff that we can actually do, actually, I have a feeling that in the future, regulators are not going, like building on blockchain is not going to be something innovative. It's going to be a regulatory requirement because the right. regulators will want to see that transparency. Regulators will want to see the fact that, you know, these things can be auditable by anyone across the world, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not going to be these sort of like, fancy thing, it's actually going to be something that regulators are going to require. Maybe I'm going to be completely wrong and we'll sit here in 10 years and talk about, but you know. I, th I think I, lo I love that example. I love the Spotify example as well. Um, and sometimes, like I've, I've heard someone use to me, they, they once mentioned to me the App Store, which was really interesting as well. If you think about like access to yeah. an application. Absolutely. Uh, being done to a certain standard that you can then acquire, but it's not just anyone writing anything that exists anywhere. It's, it's I have access to everything, but through that, that's almost the CFI to DeFi example, yeah. right? And, and like apps, you can you can grab your iPhone, you can jailbreak it, yeah, and you can install whatever app. There's thousands of apps for jailbroken phones, right? And there's a market for that. There's people that do that, right? But the majority of folks never jailbreak their phones, right? They'd be scared even about, you know, going to something called jailbreak. Like, what am I doing? This sounds terrible, right? Yeah. The majority of iPhone users don't do that. And so you, you have the curated app store that has some sort of standards, some sort of whatever. And, and there might be some problems with that itself, right? But I think you're right in the sense that, um, you know, ultimately customers will want ease of use, things that they know they can trust and um, and basically get cheaper, faster, better, mm. more access to these products. Um, you yeah. know, we definitely see that in LATAM, like people that are getting, like I was telling you folks in, in Argentina that are getting like, you know, access to stable coins. It's, it's, it's incredible, right? Like it's, it's amazing for them. You no longer have, and it's funny because you talk to people and you have people who still tell you like, look, I, I want my dollars under my mattress. That's what I want. I want my physical dollars under my mattress. Yeah. But then you have these folks that are like, this is crazy. Like I've gotten, you know, robbed twice in the last three years. Yeah. I want my dollars all digital in a place that, you know, it's in my head how to access them. And that's that, right? Do you think, do you think, I know, I'm, I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions around stablecoins separately, but just on the crypto market generally, like um, why do, do you think that the performance of the market, this is a super general question, yeah. by the way, does it track the existing markets or because it was always preached as, as something that existed outside of that, but is there more of an alignment to uh, the normal markets uh, around the world that you expected five years ago or not? Or how do you explain the coupling or decoupling from that? Yeah, so, so it's, I think it's always like a, you know, push-pull kind of thing, right? We were in a market where, you know, <laughs> negative interest rates, um, bunch of capital trying to be allocated somewhere, 
And, um, and people started, you know, we saw a boom in venture capital funding. We saw a boom in all sorts of alternative assets. And I think, you know, Bitcoin definitely benefited from that, right? And it's hard to decouple that a large portion of the world's wealth is just basically folks trying to allocate capital in whatever is best, right? If you're in a world where interest rates are zero, so you need to put that money elsewhere, mm. right? Um, and I think crypto definitely benefited from that, and we had that, um, you know, that coupling, as you as you call it, um, that happened very, very obviously. I think we saw that as uh, as the pandemic sort of started rolling around, is when kind of like, you know, I remember that that um, I forget what day it was in March, but there was like a stock market crash, as it was obvious that there was a pandemic, and Bitcoin also kind of crashed, right? Mm. And then, uh, and then Bitcoin started recuperating itself, the market as well. And, um, and then people are like, well, I thought these assets were completely uncorrelated, what's actually happening? But I think at the core, it's just like, you know, again, no interest rates, I need to allocate money somewhere. And, um, and, 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 and Bitcoin benefited from that or crypto benefited from that. Um, but I think the, 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 and so that's sort of like, you know, the macro environment pulling Bitcoin, and it's such a strong force. I mean, the macro economy is many times, many, many times larger than the Bitcoin or the crypto economy. And so it's impossible to defend against itself, mm. uh, uh, defend against like big macro pools. Yeah. Now, when there's not such a strong macro pool, which we've been in an environment of very strong macro pools over the last, you know, basically since the pandemic, um, but when those when those kind of like settle in, you do see Bitcoin or crypto doing its own thing, right? It can be more of a result of things that are happening in the crypto space themselves. Mm. Um, it can be things so like advances in technology, advances in use cases. But it's just you know before crypto gets bigger, it's just you you can't ignore the macro force, right? The macro mm. force, it, there's a reason why it's called macro. Um, mm. And it just has a very strong influence on, on everything. Now, yeah. do I expect that over the long term, these things will become more or less correlated? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. I used to, I used to think that yes, um, and I am no longer that sure. And then, I, I mean, it's very difficult for anyone to be sure, I think. Anyone who tries to be super accurate almost certainly going to be wrong, I'm afraid. So <laughs> there are too many variables for, for everyone. But the, the other block that I'm really interested in, uh, we talked about stable coins briefly, um, but uh, you know, you've know you talked about remittances or the Argentinian example, someone exposed to whatever it is, a stable coin, USDC or whatever it might be, um, completely get that. So I get the security of that versus money on the mattress or that crazy example. Um, but then, you know, we've also seen other issues recently, right? Yeah. So uh, the Silicon Valley example, we uh, Bank Valley uh, the, that we talked about, that led to something of a DPEG on, on Circle's uh, USDC. But it was quite a bit beyond that because that's been recovered. We can talk about that as well. But, you know, USDC was also the collateral for loads of other stable coins. So that sort of started to flow through. And then you've got all, you know, the biggest out there in the world, everyone knows is... Is, is Tether, and they've been, you know, prosecuted. That's all public information for the reserves not being there during a period of time. So to that art user in Argentina, what would you say? I mean, is there, there's risk everywhere. Is there a lot of risk in this? Or do you see that as if, it, do, you, do you see the circle example now almost like a stress test that they've recovered from and that there are going to be winners in this stable coin universe and the, the unregulated smaller ones will fall away? Or do you see that there's just risk that exists and people have to accept that risk? Yeah, so this is fascinating, right? Because, um, like, look, of course there's risk in anything that you yeah. do. Yeah, there's, there's risk in flying, there's risk in driving, there's risk in eating, um, there's risk in everything inherently. And there's inherent risk in everything that we do. Um, now, the question is, like, you know, what is that level of risk? And if, you, if we take the example of what we saw with USDC, you know, basically it started the pegging and, you know, it went all the way to, I believe, 88, 87 cents, something like that. As fears of 
a large portion of USDC's backing was held at Silicon Valley Bank, which suddenly was closed. Uh, regulars took over it, and nobody knew whether they would be able to access their funds, right? So uh, this is not really like, at, at heart, this is not a, a crypto issue, yeah. right? This is a risk mismanagement issue by a top 16 bank in the United States that um, that basically regulators took over and people just didn't know, are those $3.3 .3 billion that Circle has come out that said that is in Silicon Valley Bank, are they going, is Circle going to be made whole? And, and, and by Circle, I mean USDC holders, right? People got afraid, started selling USDC, then, you know, it went to 88 cents, bounced back between 88 and, and then as the news came out that the Fed was going to do a full bailout and that we're going to pay everyone, um, you know, make everyone whole, then USDC kind of re repegged. And so, but this is kind of like a crazy issue, right? Because you, we're asking, you know, do you trust, do you trust um, stable coins? And, and the question that you're really asking there is, do you trust banking? Holy smokes. Like, you know, so people are sending around these memes that were like, you know, 2020, you have to survive a pandemic. 2021, you suddenly have to like, you know, everyone wants to give everyone money. 2022, now there's no more money available. And now 2023, you need to survive your banks, you know, getting shut down, right? And it's kind of crazy. Like the world of tech, um, you know, this is, this was felt more in, um, in the tech sector because Silicon Valley Bank was a big bank for the tech sector. But like, it was the first time a lot of entrepreneurs had to like worry that their bank was going to fail and that they were going to be able to not meet payroll yeah, in yeah, 30 yeah, days. Yeah. It's kind of crazy, right? Like we talk about trust, we talk about, we talked a bunch of time about centralized um, exchanges and the inherent trust that they, you know, that customers place on them. But a lot of people don't really think about banking, right? Like if you're in Argentina, or like we have some investors in Argentina, um, and Thursday morning, they were phoning up and saying, you know, take all your capital out from Silicon Valley Bank. We don't know. They're used to these bank runs. They're used to not be made whole, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That's their attitude. But a bunch of people in the United States that had never seen that, just weren't quick to their feet, right? Yeah. Like I had friends who had not only their company's assets there, but their personal assets there. They're like, there's no way that Silicon Valley Bank is going to fail. I've met the CEO, he's a great person. Yeah. And then 12 hours later, they were saying, holy smokes. Yeah. What the hell do I do now? I suppose it's the same. It's almost what we were quasi saying it before. Like, I mean, I, I use the term sometimes, not all VASPs, or not all exchanges, not all VASPs are, are created equal. And yeah. that's so true. They can be like properly regulated platforms like Bitso, they deal with proper segregation of custom assets. And there can be others re licensed or registered in some country and really there's no controls. And there are no governance standards and there mm -hmm. are no requirements. And it's almost the same with banks, that there are, there are banks that take too much risk or don't have those proper functions in place. Yeah, and there are others, it's it's difficult. But, but you were asking me this question on like, you know, how, how will your customers really understand the zero knowledge proof of solvency? How do customers understand the risk that their banks are taking? Yeah. How did my friend who had his personal savings at Silicon Valley Bank and who had met the CEO and saw Silicon Valley Bank as a 40 year old institution that had been, you yeah. know, an important building block to the technology sector. How did he assess the risk that the bank was taking? Completely, yeah. There's no way. Yeah. This guy is focused on building his business, in the healthcare industry, and, and a little bit of biotech, and that's what he cares about. That's what he's good at, Yeah. right? So like, the, the, this question around risk is fascinating, right? Because like, uh, like we were just saying, there's risk, there's inherent risks in, in everything that you do. The question is like, you know, how do you actually monitor and how big are these risks? And that's actually really hard to do. Do you think, do you think Daniel, that the solution to that risk, I mean, is it? I mean, in the banking example, it definitely isn't. Um, I was gonna say yeah, regulation, 
creating the right ecosystems, creating the right law, creating the right infrastructure in the virtual asset world? Is that the direction that things are going? The, I mean, in the banking world, that's very different. That's long hundreds of years of law no. that isn't really... I think there's a more fundamental thing that Silicon Valley Bank um, has basically shown the world, which is that can you really have a world where you have a fractional reserve banking system with instantaneous payments and where flow of information is free, right? Fundamentally, what happened at Silicon Valley Bank was a run on the bank that was triggered through WhatsApp messages, Twitter posts, yep. email, call it whatever you want. But have we fundamentally broken banking? Because you have free flow of information and you have a system that relies on fractional reserves. And I think that's a much more fundamental question. Mm. I think no one can deny the fact that we want faster payments that are always on. Right? Like we want that, it's it's fundamental for the the, the digital economy that we were talking about. It's fundamental for the economy. Mm. But do, have we uncovered a bigger issue here? Mm. You know, um, but it needs it needs it needs like a, loads of these things. It needs um, it needs a, an element of innovation. It, it needs an element of entrepreneurship. It needs new systems to be developed. It needs a new openness to those systems. Yeah. I mean, I, I love the quote, and I use it sometimes now. Um, that uh, whatever electric light bulbs mm -hmm. did not come around from the continuous improvement of candles yeah right so it, it there's this continuities fun, fundamental reset um and you know are we at that time on the banking side of things are we at that time on the on the crypto side of things you have many countries around the world we forever hear about the securities tests in in the u.s you know the howie test and they're still arguing about that it does it require like a fundamental reset uh, does that that's that's the question i think right yeah so when I was a kid, I um, I was a big fan of Nirvana, and um, and and in and in one it wasn't a podcast, it was a radio show. Someone talked about Nirvana as you know the, the way that they described them is at some point you have enough garbage that has collected in the garbage can, and someone just needs to grab all that garbage, take it out, and put a new bag, and that's what you know this person was saying Nirvana was doing, just completely whatever. And he, like to me, there are these moments in time that kind of feel like that, right? And so my discovery of Bitcoin was one of those. It was like, okay, there's just a completely new paradigm. We need to start fresh. But it kind of feels the same right now. Like this was the this weekend was the first time ever that I had friends engaging in conversations where what they were debating was what was more important: a stable asset like a dollar or an available asset like Bitcoin, right? Where I can self-custody that. Mm. Like suddenly the fact that people woke up to a big bank kind of like, like I think what the Fed did was incredibly important. If the, my mm. sense is that if the Fed hadn't bailed out those two banks, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, we would have seen a massive run on banks on Monday uh, because people would have lost confidence in banking and it would have probably created like a, you know, well, systemic risk, effect. absolutely. Systemic yeah. risk, just systemic risk. Um, but now it's on people's minds, right? Like what would have happened if the Fed hadn't done this, right? Like my, my buddy is thinking himself that is asking himself that question. I'd never been in a, in, in a situation where suddenly like I realized that if that event materialized, I would be left with basically almost nothing. Yeah. And now people are thinking like, holy smokes, right? Like, is there a case for Bitcoin? And the answer that they're arriving to is yes. The answer that they're arriving to is, holy smokes, like, you know, maybe I don't want to put my entire life savings in Bitcoin, right? And I, that's not what I'm preaching here. But some of these folks that had never had self-custody Bitcoin asked like all weekend long, what's a good self-custody wallet? 
I want to I want to make sure that I have some money set aside for a Black Swan event. Yeah. Yeah. People yeah. are asking themselves like people have asked themselves these questions before and we talked about like you know there's there are all these cases of like you know as the Syria war really unfolded there were people that were able to, people that held bitcoin in Syria that were able to escape Syria because they had bitcoin people who had kept all their money in the banks suddenly the banks were just destroyed and there was nothing there yeah. so yeah. we had these little stories but you know it they seemed very far away for people that were you know sitting in San Francisco mm. That's a crazy story of a faraway place that I've never been to, have no connection to, et cetera, et cetera. Suddenly it hit home and now they're like, oh, you know, yeah, the yeah, Fed yeah, came yeah. in and backstopped this and that's amazing. But what if they hadn't? And, and there are other questions as well. Dan. I think that, I mean, Silicon Valley and Signature are the two examples you've given with the Fed and the FDIC coming in. There's a degree, thankfully, that that loss isn't been suffered, but what about all the other banks? And what about the crypto industry oh, yeah. with exposure to all of those uh, other banks? Those are other questions, which are arguably like another driver for, for the moves that you're talking about. I mean, it's it's difficult and everyone has a different part to play, but, but I mean, there are loads of things we can talk about there, loads of things we can talk about, but I wanted to bring it back to sort of almost close things out to a bit so related question. You, you guys, you know, the mission at the beginning, helping, let's call it less privileged people, as, as an idea or concept five, 10 years ago, um, how far along have you come in, in, in that? Is that continuing to develop? That's one question. And what do you see the biggest challenges? Next, is it banking touch points? There are different pressure points from coming from different parts of the world. The US is one of the most obvious ones. Yeah. Um, so where, where are you along the mission? And what do you think the biggest challenge are to, you know, well, the second one's a difficult question. Yeah. So you talked about my time at Quantcast. Um, you know, that was 11, 12 years ago. And um, at Quantcast, I always enjoyed working late. And, um, and the only other Mexican in the company was um, uh, the guy who was in the cleaning staff. And we would always talk about whether it was, you know, during 2010, we would talk about the World Cup and the Mexico games, or we would just talk about whatever, you know? It was, we had this common connection. And one day the guy asked me for, um, for, for a couple of hundred dollars. And I asked, I told him, Julio, I've known you for a few years. You've never asked me for money. Is everything okay? And he basically said, you know, yeah, everything's okay. It's just a uh, paycheck is on Wednesday and my daughter needs uh, money tomorrow. And so I need to send her money and it's very expensive to send money back home, right? And this actually happened right before I learned about Bitcoin. So, so this kind of a experience or this interaction with him. And, and, and even though I'd been living in the US for, for a couple of years, then I'd never actually had to send money back home. But I started to sort of understand this a little bit more. And it was just kind of crazy. Like this guy who earns minimum wage, left his family um, to go work for better opportunities to a country where he barely spoke, the, he didn't actually speak the language. Now he spoke the language a little bit, taking shitty jobs, um, but doing something to improve, basically to get something that sadly Mexico wasn't able to give him, which was like a good salary to, push his family forward and we're choosing to charge this guy like you know 10 to 12 percent of what he earns to just send money back home mm. but you could press a button on your phone and you could instantly you know i could instantly talk to my nieces for free or for almost free i was like what? this is a big dichotomy like why and so like actually before bitso i tried to build a company to send remittances from the u.s to mexico and, um, and what I found was that you could actually send the remittance through Bitcoin very easily, but then people in Mexico would get the Bitcoin yeah. and they'd be like, what do I do with this? And um, at Bitso, we've always wanted to build a more fair economic system. We've, we have always wanted to utilize this technology for it to be helpful and useful to customers. Um, and we believe that people can significantly benefit from that. Um, but you need to do this step by step, right? And so step one was to build the rails, right? Just literally allow the connection between the 
the financial infrastructure in Mexico, and we started in Mexico, now we're broadly more in Latam, but the financial infrastructure in Mexico with Bitcoin, and then you need to create liquidity and then allow people to basically go from one asset to the next. And um, I think we've, you know, we feel very good about that piece that we've built so far. And as we've built that liquidity and those connections, we've started to build more and more of that vision. And so, you know, we, as I said, we already power billions of dollars in remittances from the U.S. to Mexico. We want to do that even more, right? We believe that people can get access to fairer and better financial products by leveraging crypto. And so, like, you know, we want to make sure that Bitso, as the, as the crypto economy continues to grow, becomes basically the de facto financial account for our customers. And we want to continue to help push the crypto industry forward, make crypto useful. We want to make sure that we become, you know, a very important financial services provider powered by crypto um, in, in the Latin region. Um, but we're far away from doing that, right? And events like what happened recently in the, in the U.S. actually are a step back, right? Because... Part of our part of our rails in the U.S., um, mm. you know, were through companies that um, or banks that are no longer operating, and so we need to go out and rebuild that. And that's, you know, it's sort of part of building at the edge of technology. Um, and we need to learn what went wrong and figure out what are we going to do now. Will those be the biggest challenges? The rails? Or is that going to be? Well, short term, yes. Like immediate. That's an immediate term challenge yeah. that the crypto industry is facing, particularly around, um, you know, folks that had infrastructure in the United States. You know, luckily our infrastructure in LATAM today, knock on wood, it's great. Um, you know, we haven't seen any of the troubles that we've seen in the U.S. But so immediately is that, but the journey is, a, it's going to be a really long journey, right? And so the things that I keep on my mind are basically three. I think these have been the same things since day one. They continue to be the same things today, but I think the ambition continues to be bigger. And so then we just need to continue to working hard on these challenges. But the, but, but the three ones are basically um, regulatory. You know, we started this business thinking this was going to be a, it was like in an environment where very few regulators, if any regulator really actually knew what, mm. you know, Bitcoin was, but we always thought this is going to be an activity that's going to be regulated. And so we continue to engage with regulators across the world, educating them, trying mm. to push good regulation for the industry forward. But we see this as an enormous, um, as an enormous challenge for two reasons. Number one, because the rate of innovation is very uh, fast. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. so we're finding ourselves um, always <clears throat> you know, limited by those conversations with the regulators. There's always okay. something new. There's either a new risk or a new opportunity, but it's just challenging, right? Because yeah. the, the world is moving very fast. So regulation is one. And for there, I think policy and education are sort of the biggest, um, the biggest things that we can do. The second one is con like basically interconnectedness, right? Like how do you actually flawlessly interconnect all of these systems? Um, right now it's banking in the US, right? But it actually is also like across blockchains. It's also across mm. the CFI to DeFi world. Like how do you make these connections be as seamless as possible, which has an enormous impact on your user experience, right? So actually I would say perhaps the second one instead of interconnectedness, we should call it more like user experience. But like how do you make that customer experience be flawless, feel like magic, be intuitive, fast, easy to use, et cetera, et cetera. Like that is an enormous piece where when you need to be that bridge between these incredibly modern systems and these incredibly legacy systems, it's quite hard, completely, right? Completely, completely. And then the third thing that we talk about is just basically consumer education, right? How do we get customers to trust this? How do we get customers to understand or feel better about the fact that Bitso has a zero knowledge proof of solvency proof, right? Customer, customer education is an, is an enormous thing that we need to do. How do we prevent customers from, you know, um, 
basically doing very bad, take, making very bad decisions. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, sadly, the, the crypto world is full of amazing people building legitimate stuff that is life-changing in my view, but there's also sadly a lot of garbage out there. And so how do we educate our customers, right? Because a lot of people start, you know, in the right path, but then they get greedy and end up getting really hurt. And so like, yeah. th we feel like we need to play a role there um, for our customers, but also for the broader crypto industry. Mm. And, um, and we see that as an enormous challenge because the fact that you've created money that is truly borderless, um, and that you have the ability now to create like, you know, smart contracts on top of the EVM, et cetera. You, you've also created the ability for a lot of, um, you know, a lot of garbage. And yeah. so uh, we see that as, a, as an important thing. So I think the three challenges we had, I think were the same ones as the early days, basically regulatory, user experience and consumer education. Th those, are, those are three really good, really good points. And I know you guys are doing a lot on all three fronts. So um, I think you've got, you do have and have had a really important voice and I know you'll continue to have it. We're, we're, I think we've, we've talked for a long time. We could talk for, for hours, mm -hmm. but I'm going to say one last thing, which is, you know, you might not ever make the next Top Gun movie. I'm not sure if you're going to be it, but now you're, you're definitely a maverick. So it's, <laughs> uh, it's been great having you there. And I, you know, I, I think you can definitely take that away. Thank you so much for your time, Daniel. I could keep you all afternoon, but uh, thanks very much and um, keep pushing on the three fronts that you've talked about for sure. Thank you so much, Joey. Um, we've enjoyed partnering with you over the years in so many ways, shapes and forms. I think you've played a really important role in the industry as well. And so you are a maverick as well, and I'm honored <laughs> to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Very good.